Yes, indeed. Well, good morning, everyone. Ah, uh, well, I just, I'll sit down again. No, no. Good morning, everyone. Oh, you are there. Good. And welcome to those online. Great that you could join us this morning. So I think uh, we're ready to go, which is wonderful. Indeed. I hope you all slept well and woke well. Um, it's a beautiful morning, a beautiful day. Uh, whether you woke well or slept well, and I would imagine that uh, some of us didn't, uh, it's great that you are here uh, because what we're here to do is to be encouraged by each other and by the Word of God and by pointing us to the Lord Jesus. So it's good that you've come. Life is often hard, and uh, it's hard uh, to continue on persevering in the Lord Jesus when uh, uh, things are difficult, but that's why we come together. So, well done for coming. You can give yourself a pat on the bat. bat. In recent weeks, we've been reading from the Gospel of Luke and uh, thinking about different aspects of faith. Now, of course, Christian faith is not an airy-fairy thing. Christian faith is a solid thing. It's based and grounded in the Lord Jesus, the historical truth about Jesus. So it's not airy-fairy. It's uh, uh, historical. It's factual. Uh, today is one week before Easter, and so it's Palm Sunday. Uh, the day when Jesus was welcomed in by a madly enthusiastic crowd waving pa palm branches, uh, which was a great thing. Five days later, he was dead. And two days later, after that, he was alive. What a week that is. A week that changed the world, the centre of history. And it's a week that should change us and keep changing us. Uh, so that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. First of all, though, uh, let's sing Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. Now, I don't know whether you know it. Who knows this song? Oh, enough people? You're going to have to sing loud. Nev, will you sing loud? I'll try not to. You'll try not to. <laughs> well, you and, and Gary can be together in trying not to, and I'm going to encourage you to read, uh, to sing uh, up loud. So let's stand and sing. Ride On and Ride Jesus coming into Jerusalem and going to the cross.
least the words are great. We're going to pray a Palm Sunday prayer. So let's uh, pray this together, and then we'll sing another song. And I think we might stay seated for the second song. But uh, let's, let's say this together now. Almighty and everlasting God, out of your love for the world you sent your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to take our nature and to suffer death on the cross for our sins. May we follow his example, being prepared to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel, through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. That's a great prayer. Now, Colin Buchanan is known well to us. We're going to sing Strong and Courageous. You could stand if you want, but I think we'll just, we've just been standing. Let's, let's sing up loud, sitting down. Something a bit different. Let's do that. There are some actions. Actions? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we've got actions. <laughs> no, it's not. We're not doing actions, we are. It's up to you if you want to do actions. Yeah. I know the actions. Do you want to do that? <laughs> no, well, yeah. Okay, I know this one. I didn't know the other ones. You know this one? Yeah. We'll just sing it. Let's just sing it. Let's just sing it. And if you know the actions, It's a wonderful song, isn't it? Indeed. We have a great God who uh, uh, is strong and courageous, who's been that for us through Jesus, and we should be for him. Uh, and that should be the message for the whole world. And we have friends in 
different parts of the world who are being strong and courageous for the Lord. Uh, two of those, Nick and Keisha in Peru, and we're just going to, in just a moment, see a video. Uh, it is now seven years since they came into our sphere of influence. It's gone quick, hasn't it? Uh, it's the seventh anniversary of us uh, supporting them, and they are going to uh, uh, acknowledge that and say thank you. Uh, then we'll hear their normal uh, monthly report. So let's listen to Nick and Keisha. Ed's. Woo! I don't know why I did that. Yeah, not why. Um, it is March, <laughs> and March means... Happy anniversary! Our seventh anniversary, church and missionaries. You guys have been supporting and praying for us for these seven years, and we are very thankful for that. We really are. Thank you so much for praying for us, guys. If someone's near, if someone, if someone has their phone handy and is near the front of the church, quick, run up, take a photo, and send um, send us a photo of your lovely smiling faces. Indeed. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for praying and supporting, guys. Happy anniversary. Okay. Yama! Hello. Hi. This is March. This is March. Hi, everyone. A little bit, thankfully, this month has been quiet, much quieter than the last two months. I came, just come back from a trip to a place called Juan Cui in the north of Peru. It's uh, quite, it's tropical, it's jungle, uh, it's rice and sugarcane country with far, huge farms that both all around the place. I was meeting with a small church. I've been meeting with a pastor and his wife online for the last year or so to talk about, to practice reading the Bible and do some training. And then he invited me up to do some training with his youth and Sunday school leaders where we did an overview of Mark and had to interpret Mark. It was hot, there were mosquitoes, there were weird foods, but it was a really good time. I'm really thankful for that uh, opportunity to get up there and see them and meet a bunch of them face to face, not just through a camera. Can, is there a way people can find out what the weird food you ate was? Uh, can I email you and find out? Is that like a spoiler? They can email a guess. Which weird Peruvian critter was I? Did I have the pleasure of eating? I don't um, think anybody will get it. Yeah, but uh, if you hit, flip me with a guess, I'll tell you the right answer. Right, I'll tell you the right answer. March is going to be a quiet month in terms of travel, but there's going to be a lot of preparation as we prepare for a trip to Sikuwani, which is about two hours outside of Cusco. We're going to be there for a whole month of April teaching at a small local seminary there. I'll be teaching first year students. Nick will be teaching second year students. I have a, a New Testament, Old Testament overview, and Nick will be doing acts with these students. These aren't Mockland courses. They want different materials. So we're spending March preparing all of these classes and the assessments and the rubrics for these assessments. And it's gonna be very a very busy March. Uh, but we're really excited to head back to the seminary. We've both been there before uh, last year, and Nick has been there uh, before the pandemic, I think. So we're really excited that we get to go back and we get to contribute uh, meaningfully to this group, and it'll be really great to see how the groups are growing and uh, reconnect with some old friends. Please pray for this preparation for Sikwani. It's a lot to do. Uh, we have to get it all done before we go because it's an intensive. We won't have any time for uh, to prep during the month. And as you will see, we also have other things we're doing while we're there as well. So please pray for that. We know Sydney has been getting some pretty weird weather. Lima is no different. Some of the days have been very hot here. So if you could pray for our survival while we're slowly melting or cooking internal organs. No. <laughs> it feels like that, but it's not yeah. that bad. Um, but please pray for us that we can get work done despite the heat. Thank you for supporting us, guys. And I uh, will see you guys next month. See you from Cusco. Yeah. Next. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you for praying. Okay. We've been instructed to take a photo. So I'm going to take a photo of you all. And you can wave to Nick and Keisha and I'll send it to them. I'll also take a short video of you all saying hi Nick and Keisha or something like that you can do that will you do that yes. yeah good okay so, and and oh by the way I emailed Nick and Keisha about that food that they were talking about 
I didn't get it right, but they told me what it was, but my lips are sealed. <laughs> so you will have to find out. Sorry, what's that? It's not guinea pig. You can try something else. Jill knows, but all right. Okay, so um, I will try. Yes, that's right. I can get you all. And online too, you can wave. <laughs> I won't catch you there. But everyone wave, please. There you go. All right. That's the photo, thank you. Now the video, and you all have to say after three, uh, um, good day, Nick and Keisha, all right? All right, one, two, three. Good day, Nick and Keisha. Ah, very good, you're very obedient. All right, thank you indeed. Great. I can put that off. Um, Nick and Keisha, what were the prayer points? The seminars, they've been doing a lot of preparation in March this month, which has been great. They've got next month, uh, uh, a month at a Bible college seminary, and they're going to be doing, uh, what were they? Acts for Nick for the second years, and Old Testament, New Testament surveys for the first years. And they've got to do everything for it, um, and lots of preparation. So there's that. There's also that they will uh, survive the heat and get... Uh, uh, prepared and for their general ministry. I'm going to ask, is there two people, one or two people who could pray out loud from where you're sitting um, in a loud voice so we can all hear for them? Two people? Thank you, Lindy. And anyone else? Someone else? Yes, thank you, Christine. All right, Lindy, then Christine for the big voice so we can all hear. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity and the insight into um, what we can teach you are doing. Amen. Thank you, Lindy and Christine. The, Bible, the Bible's got lots of great passages. You might call them purple passages, passages that jump out. One of them is from Titus chapter 2, and uh, we're going to say some of that which has been moulded rightly uh, in a way that will be helpful. It's sort of like a creed from Titus chapter 2. So would you like to stand? We'll stand together and say this, this is what we believe as uh, Paul writes to us in the book of Titus, or the letter of Titus. We believe that the grace of God has appeared in Jesus to bring salvation for all who repent and place their trust in him. We believe that Jesus teaches us through his word to say no to sin and yes to godliness. We believe that our great God and Saviour Jesus is returning and this fills us with joyful and certain hope. We believe that our Lord strengthens us for his service. Amen. Great things to believe. 
Please take a seat. We're going to read. Jean's going to read the Bible for us from Luke chapter 8. Thanks, Jean. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 40 and going to verses, verse 56. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he didn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John and James and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Oops. Yep. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you that we can be together and we pray, Lord, that you'll open our hearts and minds to your word. <clears throat> and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I wonder how we see people responding to stress or difficulty or suffering. As we look around the world today, there's plenty of all three, whether we cast our minds to Africa, the Middle East, or Eastern Europe, or closer to home with Myanmar. But within our own society, uh, people are feeling the cost of living pressures, or hear about distress of family tragedies, or know the pain of facing seemingly incurable diseases. So we can't but ask, how do Christians respond to life-threatening diseases, or wars, or terrible suffering that confronts either us personally or the world. As we ponder a question like that, it's good to get a bit of a historical perspective on it, to see how Christians have reacted in the past to crises that they've faced, whether they be pandemics, plagues or wars. Back in the third century, the Roman Empire faced, confronted um, a shocking plague that killed about 25% of the population. 
Bishop Dionysius of Alexandria describes how Christians responded to the crisis they faced. He wrote this, Most of our brethren were unsparing in their exceeding love and brotherly kindness. They visited the sick fearlessly and ministered to them continually, serving them in Christ. And they died with them most joyfully, taking the affliction of others and drawing the sickness from their neighbours to themselves and willingly receiving their pains. It's amazing to read those words of the way in which Christians sacrificed in the past, how they gave of themselves in loving service. The responses of Christians to pain and suffering are humbling wherever we come across them. But they do indeed challenge us. They ask, how would I or we respond in a similar situation? Friends, the passage that we're looking at today, I suggest, helps us to understand why Christians are able to respond in these sorts of ways. So come with me as we consider the first part of the passage from Dr. Luke's account, verses 40 to 48 of chapter 8. It's a terrific passage, terrific incident that occurs here in the life of Jesus for us to reflect on, especially when we think about the crises our world is facing at the moment. Now remember that Dr. Luke's purpose in writing is to assure Theophilus of the certainty of things that have been fulfilled or accomplished amongst us. And Jesus, of course, he describes his ministry as fulfilling Isaiah 61 when he was answering the questions that John the Baptist posed that we looked at back in chapter 7. And last week we observed Jesus once more demonstrating who he truly is. Recall how he calms the storm on the lake showing his power, his lordship over disorder, over nature. And then following that, how he heals the demon-possessed man legion, restores him to his right mind, all taking place in the Gentile region on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, showing his power, his lordship over evil. And this demonstration of power by Jesus continues in the passage we're looking at today. We see his power over disease firstly and then over death. So come with me as we step ashore with Jesus for he along with his disciples have now returned back into Galilee. So after the rejection by the Gerasenes where they told Jesus to go after he'd cured the man gripped by evil demons. And so we read in verse 40, Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him for they were all expecting him. Obviously, word had gone out that he was leaving the other shore and coming back. But no sooner uh, had this overwhelming greeting occurs that Jesus confronts an urgent request. Verse 41. Then Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. It's an extraordinary scene when you think about it. See, we're encountering this man called Jairus, a name which basically means Yahweh will enlighten. And he's the head of the local synagogue, the local Jewish synagogue, the so-called worshipping community. The, in Hebrew, it's Rosh Ha Knesset. It describes what takes place there. But then we observe him more closely as approaching Jesus, not as the ruler of the synagogue, but as a desperate father, hoping against hope that Jesus could come and heal his dying daughter. But then there's a twist in the story. As Jesus begins to go with Jairus, in the midst of this crushing crowd, a desperate woman touches him a woman who's been suffering for 12 years. How will Jesus react to this apparently unexpected situation? Can you feel the tension that would have been in the air? Imagine you're Jairus. You're the ruler of the synagogue, responsible for the law of Moses to be taught and upheld. Yet you make no protest when this ritually unclean woman 
interrupts Jesus' journey to your dying daughter. The scene ought to bring us close to tears at this point. But how do we see Jairus reacting? There isn't a complaint on his lips. He's not insisting Jesus honour his prior request. There seems to be a graciousness there, perhaps a confidence that he has in Jesus' power. But then we see Jesus asking an impossible, what seems to be almost an absurd question in verse 45. Who touched me? And of course, <clears throat> Peter, um, it's beyond him <laughs> why Jesus would ask a question like this. Because everyone's pressing around him. And here's Jesus asking, who touched me? Come on, Jesus. <laughs> now, Dr. Luke, um, or what, before that, Jesus explains, doesn't he? He explains in verse 46, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. So here's the power, the lordship of Jesus in operation again, in this case with respect to disease. Now Dr. Luke doesn't tell us why the woman touches the corner tassels of Jesus' outer garment. He just says that she explains it to Jesus, not to us. But when she did do that, when she reached out and just touched him, her bleeding stopped immediately and she was healed. But Jesus then draws the woman out. Who touched me? Because he needs to get her along with the crowd to realise a very important truth. It's her faith in Jesus that's healed her. Not some random, some even superstitious touch of the garments. And so Jesus says to her in verse 48, Daughter, <clears throat> your faith has healed you. Go in peace. See, Jesus is now re-establishing this woman in her own society. For she's no longer unclean, because she no longer is bleeding. She's no longer an outcast as a result of that. Her permanent self-isolation has now ended because of Jesus. And Jesus describes what's taking place here uh, by the same sort of word he used previously about the sinful woman back in chapter 7. A word that can mean both to heal and to save. See, the woman comes touching Jesus, hoping for a physical cure. But what she receives is a deeper, saving wholeness from Jesus. Friends, I wonder why Dr. Luke records this interrupted scene. See, Jesus is responding to the request of Jairus and then this woman with the continual bleeding reaches out to him. Why has he recorded this interruption? I suggest it's to heighten the miraculous raising of the young girl. Did you notice how 12 appears twice? The girl is 12 years old. The woman has suffered for 12 years. She's been suffering for as long as the girl has been alive. And then, of course, there's another twist in the story. Verse 49. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. What heartbreaking news. This interruption has cost the life of Jairus' daughter, though it was good for the other daughter, the adult daughter, so to speak. With confidence obviously grounded in his powerful authority, the confidence that's truly breathtaking when you think of the scene, Jesus immediately urges Jairus not to fear he says to the father, the father who's just heard his daughter has died, he says, don't fear, that is, don't keep on being concerned or anxious. Rather, just believe and she will be healed. Can you sense the challenge that's there in Jesus' words? It's a challenge of faith for everyone who meets Jesus. Will you believe only what you see around you 
or in what God declares possible. And so Jesus is saying to Jairus, in essence, one thing is necessary. Believe in God. Don't surrender to despair at this point. And who could imagine what occurs next? The totally unexpected. But we see Jesus demonstrating his power, his lordship over death. The finality of this girl's death is attested firstly by the messenger that comes with the news. And of course these people confronted death all the time. It wasn't something hidden. They knew when someone was dead. And of course it's attested to the, by the appearance of the mourners, isn't it? And a common way of mourning would be to clap their hands and wail at the same time. Lots of noise. But Jesus reshapes this scene. He declares, stop wailing. She is not dead, but asleep. You can imagine the reactions going around the place, couldn't you? What's this guy on about? Doesn't he know she's dead? And then he completes the scene, doesn't he? With incredibly comforting words, isn't it? Jesus takes her by the hand and says, My child, get up. No wonder the parents were astonished, as we see in verse 56. Anyone would be. The power of life in Jesus, like the breath of God at creation, makes the girl a living being once more. This is the powerful Jesus, the Lord, that we can trust in. That we can trust in irrespective of the circumstances around us, irrespective of what we may be caught up in. Because no matter how grim they are, we know that Jesus is with us. And he is the one with power over disease and demons and disaster and death itself. Friends, whether it's pandemics like the coronavirus or devastating wars resulting in terrible suffering, we are continually reminded that we remain under the shadow of death. And we can't hide this reality behind closed doors. But we also face something worse in our modern society. For our self-deceived idea of control is a roadblock. It hinders us from relying upon God the one who's truly controlling time and history. Our society's health and prosperity covers us in a veneer of self-confidence. But when true difficulty arises, everyone tries to regain control in some way, often by small acts that dominate their daily existence. You may recall the panic buying of toilet paper during covid What a relief to know that the Bible addresses our current situation. It declares, on the one hand, we're destined to die once and after that to face judgment, Hebrews 9.27. And so the challenge is to make sure we're on the right side of that judgment. But there's more. But the Bible also comforts us by providing this assurance from Jesus. He says, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. See, Christians are the ones with real hope in a world desperate for dependable hope. But until Christ returns, Christians live in a now and not yet period of history. The now of Christ's victory over sin and death, rescuing us from the judgment to come, while also providing us with his ongoing presence in the Holy Spirit and the not yet of Christ's return when his victory will be completely applied to his people. At that time, death will be no more, neither pain nor mourning nor sorrow, only the new creation in which righteousness dwells. 
Friends, we live in stressful times due to the crises around us. But we're not to panic or fear, for God is with us through every difficulty. Remember, God's in charge. Jesus is on the throne. Salvation is won. Sin and death defeated. And of course we'll explore that much more next weekend with Good Friday and Easter Day. So how should we respond when we face crises in our lives? By anchoring ourselves continually in the gospel. Friends, we know that God reigns over history and he's a loving father to all his children. He rules history for our good, as Romans 8 reminds us. Christians know Jesus has saved us from our sins and our future in his eternal kingdom is certain. So every day until Christ returns is an opportunity to serve out of gratitude to God for all that he's done for us. The gospel has radically shaped the way Christians have faced pandemics and disasters throughout the centuries. It should also shape the way we meet the challenging times of today. The gospel equips us to see reality from God's viewpoint. And so Christians will regard pandemics and disasters as a trial of their faith in a world lingering under the curse of sin and death. As well we know that those things can never threaten our eternal hope. But Christians also realise that they are a community of mutual love built upon God's promises in Christ. Hence we care for one another and for those in need, for we love our neighbour as ourselves. And this will prove to be a very significant witness as we face the crises surrounding us. As we face crises in a world lost in the darkness of sin. Let's just pause for a moment and reflect on where our trust is in the midst of our world, in the midst of the personal things we're facing. And you might like just to spend a moment praying and then I'll finish off with a prayer. So let's just pause for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love to us in the Lord Jesus. May we face each crisis relying on your strength and wisdom and grace. We ask that you'll turn the hearts of many so that they'll acknowledge you as the God of all comfort and the God of true hope in and through Jesus Christ. Renew us by your Holy Spirit so we'll be faithful gospel servants to our family, friends and neighbours. We pray all this in the name of the Lord Jesus who died and rose again to secure our salvation, our eternal hope. Amen. Thanks, Gary. Trusting the Lord Jesus, proclaiming him, living him out. We're going to sing a song, Name of All Majesty. Great song. Let's stand and sing together, concentrating on the words as we do so. Let's sing it well.
even if we can't reach the high one, Jesus is still Lord. <laughs> Very good. Jesus indeed is Lord. But of course, we proclaim that, we want people to know that, we say we believe that, but so often we don't actually live it. So this afternoon we'll come, and for me, and possibly for you, I will say, think or do things where it's obvious that Jesus isn't Lord of everything and he should be. So I need to confess and to say sorry and to come before the Lord again and know his forgiveness. Not uh, to gain forgiveness because Jesus has already done that for, for me and for us, but to maintain that relationship with him. So let's say this now together, this confession, and uh, uh, let's do that together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbour as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us, help us to love you and our neighbour, and to live for your honour and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As the Bible teaches us, when we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just and will forgive us. Let me say this from 1 John 2, and then we can say Amen together. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What a wonderful blessing to know that in Christ, those who repent have forgiveness of their sins. And we say, Amen. Amen. We're going to come before the Lord in prayer about a number of different things. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to bring our thoughts and our requests before God, our Heavenly Father, who loves us dearly as children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed our Father, that you are good, gracious, kind and loving, and that you think the world of us, so much so that you sent your Son to die for us so that we might be his brothers and that we might be your children. Father, we thank you for this wonderful truth and we pray that you would help us to remember it every day in every way. Father, it is a great week, a week that changed the world as we remember what Jesus has done. As he came to Jerusalem, as he lived and died, but rose again and is now ascended to your right hand as king, ruler of the world. Help us to remember this and we pray that this week we would have opportunities to speak to others of you. Help us to use this time of Easter to proclaim the gospel in little ways or big ways to family, friends, neighbours. We pray for this so that the truth of you and the truth of the Lord Jesus would be made known and that people would become Christians, followers of Jesus too. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray for the services in our church coming up on, on Friday and Sunday. We pray that uh, your word would be clear, that you'd help Gary to preach that well and clearly. I uh, pray that people who are here that come along, perhaps for the first time or just a Christmas and Easter people, we pray that they would hear the gospel and turn in faith to the Lord Jesus. So we pray for that. We thank you for our church, its life. We thank you for our leaders. We particularly pray for our parish council and wardens, for Lynn, for Cheryl, for Sylvia and Christine, for Andrew, for Paul Thompson, Paul Rutledge. We pray that you would help them to be skillful in what they do, to be wise 
and to lead us well. And we pray for Gary as he leads them as well and, and takes them through things that need to be thought about and talked about and prayed about. We pray for our nominators, for Cheryl, for Marie, for Andrew, Scott and Brian. Pray that you give them wisdom as they seek a new pastor and new minister for our church. Thank you for them. Give them wisdom and skill. Um, and we do pray that very soon they'd be able to provide uh, a new pastor for us into the future. We pray for our ministries. Uh, ministries of our church, we pray for our scripture teachers. We thank you for them. Thank you for the great opportunity it is for them to be able to speak to children about you. Pray that you would give them uh, a good preparation. Pray that they would have wonderful opportunities. Help them to be able to look after the children well, that children would be listening, and that they would respond. We know how children are so responsive so often to the gospel, and we pray that that would happen. Pray for our Bible study groups and their leaders. May these groups uh, be truly a loving and caring environment. Uh, most of all, that they would hear the truth of the gospel, be able to understand your word, and that they'd help each other to put it into practice. And for our youth and children's ministries, we pray for them and for their leaders. Pray that you'd help them to be wise, the leaders, and that uh, uh, the children and youth would hear the gospel and respond to it too. Father, we've uh, uh, heard from Nick and Keisha this morning, our mission partners. We pray for them again and we ask your hand upon their lives and their preparations this month. We also pray for our brothers and sisters in Myanmar and ask for much fruit from their lives and labours and for safety for them in a very unsafe situation. And more broadly, we pray for CMS and for BCA. We pray for their work, their leaders. Please give them wisdom and that the gospel would go forth through them and their work. We take now just a, a, a moment or two to bring before the Lord people you know um, in our fellowship or perhaps elsewise that certainly do need the Lord in their lives or need uh, comfort, reassurance, healing. Please bring people now before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you delight to hear our prayers. Whether we are um, clear and eloquent or stumbling in our words, whatever it might be, thank you that you are our loving Heavenly Father and you will act for our best interests and for those we have prayed for now. Thank you for each other. Thank you for our time this morning. Please go with us and keep us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we do finish off, just a few announcements. Church family news. Uh, three things there. There's a prayer meeting uh, regular on Wednesdays at 9 o'clock here. Please, uh, if you can come, join us there. Uh, services on Good Friday and Sunday Easter Day, 8.30 and 10.15, normal times on Good Friday. Uh, the 8.30 services, Lord's Supper. And on Easter Day, there's the normal three services uh, at the same times as well as you can see on the screen. So that's what's happening there. And Gary wants to say something. Um, friends, uh, just a couple of things. There are a number of uh, folk who have come down with COVID. So you might just like to um, keep that in mind. Um, and just to uh, take normal precautions. Uh, that you uh, feel appropriate for yourself um, in that. Okay, so we could pray for all those that are uh, suffering from COVID at the moment. Um, also, uh, I think uh, Laura sent through a note about I think the AGM for 316 Tuesday night at an hour at 7 o'clock. Um, if you want to go to that, and that's when it's on. All right. Also,
also, if you receive um, the electronic bulletin and um, if you find that sometimes things don't come through as either clearly or maybe something's missing out, like some people seem to have got you know, like the bulletin at the times where the services next week haven't quite come out, um, please just uh, get back to us so we can just check on that. Um, we're going to send out a PDF format this week and uh, see if that um, um, conquers all those problems for some people that have them. So just watch out for that. Um, but if you have some trouble with any of those problems, just get back to us, okay? So we don't want you to be fuddled or muddled as a result of something going wrong with computer programs, all right? Um, I think that would be all. Uh, the other thing is that. Um, it's hard for us to keep abreast of things that happen in the political scene around Australia and there are a few things happening both in the state as well as federal uh, government. So we need to pray that God will restrain wickedness and vice so that uh, things which are unhelpful for the gospel, unhelpful for biblical truth may not um, get passed. Uh, but also that the opportunities for um, Christian truth to go out in places like schools, for example, um, under some of the proposals for religious discrimination acts coming to a federal level, that the, that those things may not take place. So that particularly our schools will be able to maintain um, iron policies where Christians are the people they can employ and not being forced to employ people that either aren't Christians or do not believe the things that the school stands for. So just Keep praying for those things. Follow the things up that are that take your interest in those areas. It is hard to keep abreast of everything, um, but um, please remember to pray at least generally and follow up as appropriate. Thanks, Gary. Uh, finally, there are new copies of Southern Cross if you want to pick one up on your way out to morning tea. Any other announcements? We're going to sing. And we're going to sing great old song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Let's stand and sing.
wants us to and will help us. Let's say this to finish with. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Christ. Please encourage each other, even pray for each other uh, over morning tea. That would be good.